The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the fifth chapter of Luke. <coughs> Luke chapter 5, we'll be reading verses 1 through 11 there this morning. Luke chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. Well, once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. But when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything. And followed him. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Now, O oh God, we pray for ears to hear, to hear your words as they speak to us through these words of Scripture. Eyes to see the way that you would have us to go. Hearts open for the love you have for us. Love you have for us to share with all who cross our paths. So help us, Lord, now as we seek to receive this from you. May we receive it gladly. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. (coughs) Excuse me. Just making sure that was still on. (laughs) It feels like a lifetime ago now. But when I was in college, I spent a couple of summers working as a summer missionary at a place called the Coffee Baptist Vineyard Christian Retreat Center in Ayrton, Alabama. We just called it the Vineyard for short because that's a lot to say. That place will always be special to me. It's where I met and fell in love with Sally. But it's also a place where I worked a lot of long, hot summer days for next to no pay, all in the guise of serving the Lord. I recall a particular day during my second summer at the vineyard when I was mowing the grass on the ball field. We didn't have a fancy zero-turn mower back then. They were just getting started, and we were, well, let's just say uh, cheap would be the word, at the vineyard. Well, what we did have was an old red belly Ford tractor converted to burn propane, and we had a finish mower that would hook to the back of it and run off the PTO. And I always like driving that old tractor because, one, I just like to drive tractors. It's always sort of a soothing thing for me. And I always especially like to drive it to cut the ball field because that old Ford was slow and the ball field was long and wide. So it made for a good way to spend a good part of the day. But on this particular day, I was about halfway done mowing the ball field when I looked up and saw my friend John running towards me. Arms waving, obviously trying to get my attention. I just kept mowing as I headed towards him. He was running towards me. And I began to feel the rain drop. The back of my neck, on my arms, watch it hit the hood of that Ford and evaporate. As I came closer to John, I throttled the tractor down, disengaged the mower. When John made it to me, he was catching his breath. I thought something horrible had happened. I said, what's wrong, John? He goes, "I I need your keys. You left the windows down in your truck, and it's about to rain. It's right about then that I started to feel bad for John. You see, many of you should be able to recall a time when cars and trucks didn't have these fancy power windows. 
when you didn't need to turn the ignition switch on to let your windows up or down, when all you had was a little crank, a handle on the door that you just rolled, you literally rolled the window up or down. These were the type of windows I had on my little S10. And so I looked at John, and without saying a word, I just did this. He had run across the parking lot, down a hillside trail, literally over the creek and through the woods to get to me, asking for my keys. And now he was going to have to turn around, run all the way back across the ball field, across the creek, through the woods, up the hill, across the parking lot, and realize he had wasted a trip. When he realized what I was telling him, he sort of smacked himself in the head and turned back to run that way. I engaged the mower blades, but before I could throttle the tractor back up, I saw him almost stop and wheel around and come running back. I said, what is it? He goes, what if the doors are locked? <laughs> Take a minute. <laughs> Think about that. <clears throat> now, as unfortunate as John's momentary lapse of logic may have been, I think we've all been in a similar situation. I bet. Maybe not one that extreme. Maybe a time when we put a great deal of effort into something only for someone to, to show us, to tell us, to remind us, it's really not as hard as it seems. It's really not as complicated as all that. Like those times you've witnessed someone, because you've never done this yourself, walked up to the store door, and no matter how much you pulled and pulled to go in, you just would not open, and the sign clearly said it was open, it was business hours, you're not confused, and you pull, and you pull, and you give up just to watch somebody come in and gently push the door open and walk right in. Or those times, at least when I was a mechanic and you tried to turn a bolt or a nut so many times you just stood on the wrench, you got everything but the cutting torch out and somebody comes over and says, no, no, that's a left-handed bolt. It goes the other way. Or how about those times when you've wrestled with that lid on that can of tomatoes you put up last year only to have your wife come in and run it under the tap and go, just lift it right off. You can be more than a little embarrassed in those situations, I suppose. Maybe even feel a bit ashamed, weak, or foolish. I can't help, though, but think that maybe, maybe that's how Peter, Luke calls him Simon in this passage, maybe that's how Peter must have felt when Jesus got in his boat. Now, there's a lot going on in this passage of Scripture this morning. Luke starts by telling us the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear the word. I love that image, pressing in on Jesus. Tell the truth, I don't know how many people press in for those sorts of things anymore. Maybe on Black Friday, they press in to the Walmart. Maybe, maybe they press in to get into the premiere of Star Wars or something like that. But to hear the word of God, I don't know. But Jesus has been teaching and healing around in the region. And his reputation has caught up with him. And so this crowd has gathered to hear what he might have to say. And they have no sense of personal space. And so Jesus, we're told, saw two boats there at the shore. He got into one of them, the one belonging to Simon, whose mother-in-law he healed just a few verses before. And he asked him to put a little ways out from the shore. And then Jesus, Luke tells us, sat down. That's the teaching position of a rabbi. Sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. And that's a nice little scene if you think about it. There's no podium, no, no lecture hall. People aren't gathered around. They're just Jesus out on a boat and a crowd gathered on the beach. It's a nice little scene. But at the heart of this text is Jesus' exchange with Simon Peter. Because after Jesus has finished speaking, after he's taught the crowd, he says to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Now, as best I can tell, in the last four chapters of Luke, Luke never mentions anything about Jesus' angling skills. There's no mention of Jesus having experience with commercial fishing practices or net casting techniques. Nothing. In fact, most of the time, people just refer to him as what? A carpenter, a teacher, a healer. So why does Jesus all of a sudden believe it's his place to tell Simon Peter, the experienced, family-owned, commercial fisherman, where to cast his nets? Does Jesus know something Peter doesn't know? 
Is Jesus curious about what will happen? Maybe he hasn't been fishing before and he's out on the boat, sort of like, you know, when you take someone fishing for the first time. Do you think I can throw it over there by them sticks? Maybe not. You'll get to the hook. But I saw on TV one time. Maybe. I don't know. Was Jesus hoping maybe after this pro bono speech to a crowd, he could get some pro bono seafood? I don't know. But whatever it was, I've got to think Simon was at least a little annoyed by the request. Maybe that's confessional. Maybe I would have been annoyed. But Simon answers, Master, we've worked all night long and have caught nothing. Simon and his crew, who have no doubt fished that very lake for years, they knew all the spots where the fish were, all the best tricks. They knew the right temperature, the right nets, the right depth, how long to keep it in the water. They knew all of that. They knew the best way to catch the most fish. And they had fished all night long and caught nothing. They were exhausted. They were frustrated and likely filled with that sort of anxiety that comes when you know you've got hungry family back at home waiting for you to bring in the fish to put food on the table. But the paycheck just isn't going to come until the fish are in the boat. And so Simon could have looked Jesus square in the face and said, Jesus, I appreciate it. But why don't you just stick to preaching? And let me do the fishing. But instead, Simon says, likely out of exhaustion, if you say so, I'll let down the nets. Now what happens next is vacation Bible school history, right? When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boats, come over and help them. And when they had brought and filled the boats, they both began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish. And also, so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And then Jesus says to Simon Peter, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people or you will be fishers of men, as we've heard before. You've heard that story. Heard it a hundred times, probably. Simon Peter lets down the net into the deep water, just as Jesus told him. And despite the fact that they had fished all night, despite the fact that they had been doing this their whole lives and caught nothing, here their nets were beginning to break because there were so many fish. And maybe, maybe Simon was embarrassed or even a bit frustrated, but that all seemed to evaporate when he realized what had just taken place. Jesus had provided through this miraculous catch of fish. It was most likely the greatest catch they had ever made in their entire... I bet their daddy and granddaddy had never caught anything like this on the lake. Jesus had provided enough to feed their families, enough to keep the fishing business going, enough for his partners and their families and their businesses. So many fish. This was an answer, no doubt, to the countless little prayers these fishermen had been saying all night long after they cast a net. God, please, just this time, maybe a few fish in the net, nothing. Maybe this time, just a few fish in the net and nothing. And now... Jesus has answered their prayers. This was an answer to the prayers of the wives and children at home who had been hoping for a fishing boom so they could finally move out of that apartment, get the car fixed, go back to school, get new shoes for the kids. This was the kind of blessing that you hear about those those preachers on TV late at night who were selling miracle prayer cloths and spring water. And Simon is in awe. He is in awe of Jesus And what has just happened? And so he says to Jesus, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy of this blessing. I'm not worthy of this. Leave me alone because I'm a sinful man and unworthy of this blessing. Everyone around him is amazed at what's happened. And maybe even a little frightened. Which is why I think Jesus says to Simon Peter, don't be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. Now, if the story ends there, as it so often does in Bible school, if the story ends there, it's a great story about calling. It's a great story about conversion, 
Blessing, evangelism, discipleship. Jesus shows who he is to Simon Peter. Simon responds in humility and Jesus accepts him and then calls him to this new vocation of catching people. If the story ends there, it's a wonderful miracle story of how Jesus produced this great catch of fish where there was once nothing. How Jesus provided for Simon Peter, for James and John. One could even carry on assuming that this great catch of fish would spark hope in the lives of those in that very village who would depend on the fishermen to come into shore with enough fish to keep the local economy afloat, to keep the Romans happy and their taxes satisfied. You could even go so far as to say and imagine the faces of those mothers and children standing there on the shore, bright-eyed and grinning as those loaded boats lumbered in with their promising payloads. If the story ends there, Jesus is the great provider. The one to whom we turn when the cupboards are bare, when the accounts are overdrawn, when we fished all night long and haven't caught a thing. But the story doesn't end there. There's that little hanging on verse in verse 11. When they had brought their boats to the shore, they left everything and followed him. Now hang on a minute. Jesus gives them this miraculous catch of fish. Not just a lot of fish, not just, okay, thanks, Jesus, we caught this many Monday. No, they had an overload in two boats and they just leave them flopping on the shore. They have just caught all these fish, enough to provide for their needs, enough to answer their prayers, and they just leave them there with the boats and all. Not just the fish in the nets, the boats, the oars, everything. They just leave it there. There are families at home depending on those boats of fish. Markets waiting for the boats to come so they can open, so they can do their businesses. There's no welfare system, no social security, no business insurance. What are they doing? These people are crazy. You can write that down. Chris said it. They are crazy. I mean, we'd be foolish to do anything like that, wouldn't we? We'd be foolish to take for granted the things that God gives us just to leave them to follow Jesus, right? I mean, if God gave us everything we have, we'd be crazy to give it all up, wouldn't we? I mean, if God blesses me, who am I to not take full advantage of that blessing for myself and my family, right? I mean, surely, surely we don't confuse the blessing with the one who gives it. Surely we'd never fall into the trap of believing that this whole thing called faith is about what we get out of it. That a life of faith is is about some, oh, I don't know, reward that we get for following the rules, for staying out of trouble. Claiming that we're doing everything Jesus had taught us to do, what we believe is right, would we? I mean, that'd be like fishing all night long, knowing what we were doing, knowing the right places to go. And then some traveling preacher comes along and tells us to fish somewhere else. Surely we would never value the gifts, the opportunities, the blessings we receive more than the one who gave them. Right? I mean, if that's if that's the case, we may as well just say the only reason we're following Jesus in the first place is to get something out of it. That the only reason we're following Jesus is so we can have a better social life, a more comfortable life. That the only reason we're following Jesus is so we can avoid pain and suffering. If we value the gifts more than the one who gives them, then does that mean we're only following Jesus for the fish? That we're only following Jesus To avoid our own fear of hell or embrace our own hope of heaven? I mean, if it isn't about following Jesus, about actually loving Jesus, about seeking to love the God we know in Christ with all of who we are, if it isn't about loving all of those who Jesus loves, catching all of those people, all of God's people with the same love with which Christ caught us, if it isn't about that, then we may as well just sit in the boat counting our fish and continue to believe it's all about us and what Jesus can do for us. But if you desire a faith that is about more than that, 
about more than just what you can get out of it. If you long to be a part of who God is and what God is doing, and if you truly desire to follow Jesus, then heed the example of Simon and those fishermen. Do what Jesus says. Go where Jesus calls you to go. Be the one Christ is calling you to be and leave everything else behind, even the stuff that God has given you. Never forgetting that the pursuit of the one who gives the gift is always, always greater than the gift itself. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, just as you called Simon and those fishermen so long ago to put down into the deep water, to bring up that great catch of fish, and then to leave it all behind, God, we know you still call us to do the same. So strengthen us, Lord, as we seek the best way we can to respond to that call. And each day with each breath, each moment, we give up a little bit more of who we are so that we may take on more of who you are. Help us, Lord, to have the courage to follow you, to leave behind the things we value and take for granted. Believing, Lord, that the one who gives the gift is always greater than the gift itself. So be with us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.